Welcome to the DJE Podcast, where you will learn about real estate investing from real life examples. Here's your host, Devin Elder. Hello, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining today. My guest is Mr. Neil Bauer. He's founder and CEO of Grow Capitus. Dot com And they've got a pretty substantial marketing presence out there. Neil's been doing real estate since 2008. Um, and it's a great guy. A lot high energy, but, but very data-driven. And so he spends a lot of time talking about, about that, about how they look at markets, how they look at asset classes, how they look at um, – you know, what's going on with the Fed right now, what they're thinking for this back half of 2024. And he's a, he's a sharp business guy, had, you know, a software company um, and then has a, a virtual assistant company and they've got 20 plus virtual assistants with their current team now. So consummate business guy, been a real estate guy, lots of asset classes, lots of markets, and he's an open book with this stuff. So I really, really enjoyed it. And I hope you do too. Let's get into the podcast with Neil. This episode is brought to you by DJE Texas Management Group, a San Antonio, Texas-based real estate investment and management company with a track record of completing hundreds of millions of dollars of transactions since 2012. If you're an accredited investor and would like to learn about investing alongside us in Texas real estate, register for our webinar at djetexas.com slash income fund. Neil Bauer, welcome to the show. How are you, sir? Fantastic. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for making some time. Look forward to diving in, talking shop on real estate. For the benefit of the audience here, uh, you're, you're out there, you're everywhere, but if folks haven't uh, met you or seen you, what's your background? How'd you get into real estate? I'm a technologist, computer science degree, data science is my background. And I uh, fell into real estate by accident when uh, the founder of my uh, technology company asked me to build a campus from scratch in 2003. And that's when I discovered the wonderful benefits of real estate depreciation and yes. then went all in in the 2008 time frame when I was buying a home every 30 days. Nice. We, these long-term rentals, flips, what were you doing back then? Those were long-term rentals back then, and I still own about 70% of them because my wife fell in love with them. And, um, you know, with, 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 with the wife, logic often doesn't work, so she still manages uh, dozens of those rentals that I bought for pennies on the dollar back in 2008, 2009, and 2010. Um, I've moved on. My, professionally, I got into uh, real estate in the 2013-2014 timeframe. We sold our company. I had a massive, massive, gigantic tax bill. And the only way to defray that tax bill was not just to invest money into real estate, but to become a general partner so I could benefit not just from the depreciation from my own investments, but also from the benefit, benefit from the depreciations from the limited partners investments. And so I've been a general partner ever since. I like it. I like it. Solving problems there. Uh, just for context here, these houses, what market were they in? And, and just ballpark, you know, 2008, 2009, that was a while ago now. What was your basis and what do you think those houses are worth just for snapshot? Sure. Here? Sure. So, um, you know, after I built a bunch of campuses for, for my technology company, no investors, no banks, it was just, you know, cash that we were putting in and building them. My, uh, because my tax basis was going down each year, my, you know, the, the cash that I had in the bank was going up. All of a sudden I'd gone from making money to keeping money, right? And that right. was the, the big change in my life and it happened between 2004 and 2008. So by the time 2008 kind of came around, I had a lot of money in the bank and I was ready to deploy. Um, I started doing research and because I'm a data scientist, I basically look at everything from a perspective of numbers. So I started looking at various avenues to deploy my money, whether that was the stock market, real estate, timber, or all kinds of other things. And my data science was showing me that in 2008, this was the greatest time to invest in real estate in a century. 2009 was even better as prices continue to fall. And so I would go to um, my family events and I would tell them, hey, I think this is the greatest time of 100 years. Look, this is what my statistical analysis software is saying. And I would be screamed at, yelled. I was told that I was infecting other people in my family with stupid beliefs and everyone would lose their money. And so then I was banned from family gatherings for 18 months. Oh, wow. um, I wasn't, I wasn't invi invited. And as a result, I, and this made me extremely angry. 
um, I decided that I would basically go and implement what my my statistical analysis software was saying. Um, but I was also afraid that if I got it wrong, then I would be the laughing stock of my family for the rest of my life. So I really wanted to do a good job. So I decided to hire a Ukrainian hacker. Um, and that Ukrainian hacker spider dozens of different websites for me, Zillow, Trulia, Redfin, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, and uh, a bunch of other sites like that to gather information because I was I wanted to answer one question, Devin, and I'll come back to what you said, but it's really that the key part of the story is I wanted to answer one question. What city in the United States is the best for real estate investing for a novice? For a novice, right? Mm -hmm. So if you know your market, you're probably doing a better job than me, but I didn't know much about real estate. So for a novice, what is the best city in America to invest in? And so we, we, we put an absolutely massive amount of data into a database uh, called R. It's a statistical analysis software that data scientists use um, and churned through it. And basically the answer it came up with, and you know, I don't want to get technical, so I'll just say, here's what it came up with. The single greatest metric that matters during a crash is peak value versus current value. So just mm. calculate the difference between peak value and current value, and whichever city has the greatest number is likely to be the safest to invest in. I'm sure there's a million other ways to be successful, but this made sense to me. And so I went out and spidered that information for all 323 metros in the United States. And I went in and invested millions of dollars into the city that came up at number one. I didn't know anything else about that city. I didn't know if it was a good city or a bad city to invest in, but my software was saying, this is great. So I made yeah. the investment into Madeira, California, which is 144 miles from the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and 20 miles north of Fresno. And I went out there and bought homes for uh, $90,000 to $100,000 each. Uh, they're currently between three hundred fifty and 400000 each. Um, and uh, But in the intervening 15 years, I've probably monetized them you know to a 10x or 15x level because i've even on day one they already were making a thousand dollars in rents those right. rents are currently at 2800 on average so i you know i there's been no point where i haven't made back my investment i've already made it back i've already refinanced i don't have much cash in them anymore but they're still you know worth three and a half four x so if i look at my total um, return over that time frame, it's it's probably you know 10x to 20x. Um, I was buying one a month for every month of 2008 and every month of 2009, and then I stopped in 2010, which is the biggest mistake of my life because what I didn't know is that after you hit 10 loans and you're forced to stop, I was doing 10 loans, then I started buying in my mother-in-law's name, um, but eventually I ran out of loans for her as well. She didn't make as much money, so I didn't get all the way to 10. What I didn't know is you can take these 10 loans and wrap them into a, a single commercial loan. Right. And then start on your 10 again. Yep. If I'd known that, I probably would have several hundred of them today. Yeah. But maybe it was a blessing, right? At some point, these things are hard to manage, hard to scale. Um, what was the tipping point for you getting into larger commercial deals? 2013 in July, the technology company that I'd run from 1999 to 2013 uh, was sold. Um, we were sold at a class leading multiple. It was not a dot com. It was a technology company. It had lots of customers, 400 employees. Um, you know, I'm still under NDA, so I can't tell you how much it was, but it was a very large amount of money. And so I went to my CP and I said, if I take these millions of dollars and I just invest them all in real estate, let's call it multifamily, will I have a zero tax bill? And he said, not even close, Neil. You're not going to get to a zero tax bill. Because remember, there wasn't bonus depreciation back then. We've had bonus depreciation in the last few years. That was just regular depreciation. So right. millions of dollars didn't equate to millions of dollars of, of depreciation. It, it, you know, it was a lot less. So he said, but, but if you could invest this money together with a bunch of investors and be a general partner, maybe you buy a building where the equity check is $5 million and you put in a million and the other investors put in $4 million, you realize you would still get 30% of their depreciation as the general partner. So now your depreciation has more than doubled for the same million dollars, right? And I was like, okay, this is really great. How can I be a GP? And then I thought about this. I've been preparing to be a GP for five years because starting 2009, because of my family banning me, I decided that I wanted to share what I was learning from data science with other people to make sure that I wasn't missing something, right? Once again, didn't want to be humiliated in front of my family. So I basically created a meetup group in the in 
inside of my business. So I had these large conference rooms, you know, with a, with seating capacity for 100 and projectors. And I was like, instead of me, you know, fighting through San Francisco Bay Area, you know, traffic, how about I create the meetup in my building and then I org invite other meetup group owners to come in and use my space for free, right? It's my space. I can do whatever I like with it. And then this way I can walk from my corner office into a big conference room, 250 feet, and that's my commute for my meetup group. Right. So I started that 2009, really got into it 2010, 11, 12. And what was happening is initially I gave it some really stupid name like real estate data analytics for, you know, for data science and some I can't even remember what it was, but it was horrible. Devin. It was terrible. Right. And and even then a whole bunch of geeks showed up because, hey, I'm in Silicon Valley. Right. I mean, the, if you throw a rock, you're going to hit a geek and it's going to bounce off and hit another geek. Yeah. Right. There's like, you know, this is like, you know, the home of uh, all the geeks in, in, in the US. So I was still getting a bunch of people coming to my meetup, but it was like, you know, four people in this meetup and 10 or 15. And then somebody comes in and says, you know, you what, what you're teaching here, what you're showing is so revolutionary compared to other meetup groups. Why don't you have a hundred people and standing room only? And I said, I don't know. And he said, you know, I'm a marketing guy. It's because you have the worst possible name and the worst possible description. Let me write your description. So he basically changed the name of my group to Location Magic how to find the best cities for investment, real estate investment in the US. And then he wrote a description and then he gave me a bunch of graphics. And basically we stuck all of those into the meetup group and 12 months later, Devin, standing room only, right? We, we weren't even providing food or, or water. It's just people were just showing up in droves. And, and, and then somebody suggested, hey, <coughs> the system that you have that you're showing off, you're you're giving us the output of this system. You're saying, hey, Madeira, California is a great place. Provo, Utah is a great place. These these all these cities, you're giving us the output. We want to be able to do this ourselves. And I'm like, no, this is really complex. I mean, there's there's so much configuration that goes in. He says, don't bother with that. Why don't you find a simpler version of this, basically a light version of this, and pack it into a toolkit and give it away for free. And then also you can continue telling people about the hard version if they want to do that one. And and I was like, no, why wouldn't anybody want to do the hard version if it's better? And I, he said, how much better? I said, well, the version that is the hard one that I'm doing has a 96% correlation to profit, which is a very, in my world, the world of data science, I know I'm being geeky here. It's a very high correlation. One, one is the maximum correlation, so 96% is, a, is almost at you know 100% correlation. And then though this toolkit that you're talking about probably have a 90% correlation. He said, fine, just build it anyway. So I locked myself away uh, Christmas 2010 or 11, I don't remember which year it was, and created this toolkit. I called it the Location Magic Toolkit, and I reduced the number of variables from hundreds of variables to five, the five that made the biggest difference. I already knew which five they were because I had all the variables, so I can tell which ones were affecting the profits the most. And so I take these five variables, I stick it into a simple toolkit, and I create a course. I launch it the next week. The meetup group audience loves it. Everybody's just, you know, I'm like, yeah, but I have this harder version and people are like, I don't care about your harder version because your easier one allows me to, to compare any city in America with any city in America in 10 minutes and that's all I care about. 90% is good enough for me, right? So I learned a big lesson there, Devin, that a lot of times people want what's fast, cheap, quick. They don't necessarily want the, the best of everything. Right. And so I, I stopped really at that point, more or less working on the more complex one. I still work on a more complex one than the, the five, um, you know, parameter um, location magic course, which has now become very popular. So my, my internal parameters are maybe 30 or 40 parameters, used to be hundreds. So I've actually simplified inside as well because I learned a valuable lesson there. So by 12, 2012, 2013, there was this community using location magic in the Bay Area, lots of people working with me, offering to give me money. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm running a technology company. I'm working 12 hours a day. I'm investing. I'm a landlord. I don't have time to take your money. You just put your name on this list and maybe one day in the future we'll talk, right? So over time, Devin, thousands of people were getting added to the list and that really liked me and trusted me because they knew that I had nothing to offer, nothing to pitch. I had no course. I had no you know, product. We were just in a meetup group sharing stuff, right? Other people were going out there buying these homes, making millions of dollars and sending me thank you notes, right? I even got like a really fancy gift from somebody that made a million dollars work for Apple and apparently invest in millions of dollars based on what I said. So it was it was wonderful, but it was just a pastime and you know a, a great place to meet friends and, and talk. And then in 2013, when 
this thing happened with the company, I'm like, I could be a GP. And so what I did was I did three months of immersion into multifamily, learned a lot of multifamily, met up with other people that knew a lot more, went to courses, you know, spent some money. Sure. Then I came back and put buildings in contract. And I thought it would take me six months to raise the money. It took six days because I'd really been raising that money in a weird sort of way for the last four years by building my brand. And so when it actually happened, I went from zero to 100 in the world of general partnership overnight. Overnight. What was that first deal? So it was a 237 unit apartment complex. And uh, we basically, it was a very standard deal. There was nothing special, nothing sexy uh, about it. And I think um, we were putting back then, you know, the LTVs are pretty high. So I think the, uh, I was a four and a half million um, in, in equity that was raised. Uh, you know, a significant portion was mine. I also put money into other deals because even that one property didn't get me to zero for taxation. Sure. And so I was doing other properties, um, buying in uh, Dallas, buying in Chicago, Atlanta, um, uh, Provo, Utah, Salt Lake City, a lot of the usual places that people were going to. Only my data science was giving me an 18 to 24 month advantage before those, you know, 24 months after I would publish a list of cities, Devin, they would start showing up with all of the syndicator tutors. Because those syndicator tutors, they, they, the people that were teaching people how to syndicate and how to be general partners, they knew more than I did about buying buildings. They knew more than I did about managing buildings but they weren't data scientists. So it was taking a while for them to figure out cities and I was buying before them. How was that first project? Uh, that's a big change, right? You got single family, you're looking at the data, but then jumping in, were you guys the, the primary general partner operator on that? Or did you have some local boots on the ground? How did you structure that? I had partners. I mean, you know, early on, Devin, I just feel like I didn't know enough. Um, I don't even think my partners knew enough. So I had partners in many of my, I think all of my initial projects, maybe for three or four years had partners and some did well, some didn't do, do well. There's just a lot of learning that went through that whole process. Um, and so we, um, we sort of muddled through it, right? And, you know, that wasn't necessarily as good of a time as 2017, 18, 19, 20 were in terms of you know cap compression in terms of rent you know growth because there were still millions and millions of homes in the US that were empty at that point of time so we sort yeah. of had to muddle through it yeah yeah no makes sense um yeah quite a run there kind of 2012 to 2020 with cap rate compression and um rent growth and all the things you mentioned what yeah. uh let's talk about the last, starting the last... 2020 a different world that we live in yeah i was going to say <laughs> the last 4 years have been pretty wild um, you know, we're talking in May, 2024, obviously COVID and the aftermath and, um, and inflation and rate hikes and all that stuff. Um, how has your approach changed? I guess let's ask, let's talk more about since the rate hikes, you know, COVID was one thing, but it was pretty, pretty sharp V right. Once all the liquidity got ejected, it was, um, you know, that was just kind of a wild thing, but, but then, you know, for operators at that time, you kind of had some liquidity come in. You had tenants getting maybe help from federal or local municipalities with rent and everything. Um, so it wasn't as, as impactful, at least it wasn't for us, but then the rate hikes certain certainly have been. So how's the last two years been for you guys and how are you approaching that? So, once COVID struck, we started to slow down buying because interestingly enough, once COVID struck in April or March 2020, within five or six months of that, you know, prices of properties were going crazy because the rates had abruptly dropped to zero and the institutional yeah. partners knew that this couldn't, you know, this was not normal. And so they started to buy. And so we were thinking, well, prices would stay low for until all of the um, you know, the, um, the rent abatements were lifted, but that didn't happen. Prices started to rise in the fourth quarter of 2020. And then 2021 was a completely wild year for prices, the most insane increase in prices that you could see. So we, our, our math showed us that this was not a great time to buy. It was a great time to sell. So all of 2021 and 2022, uh, we just focused on, on maximizing our assets, getting them to a peak, you know, NOI and just selling them. So nice. nine assets were, well, seven assets were sold during that time frame, and then two were sold subsequently. So nine assets were exited. So we had a lot of exits. In terms of purchases between um, the, between uh, maybe mid 2020 and 
mid-2022, two years, we only bought two assets, one of which was our own asset. We just bought out some partners that just wanted out and we didn't want out. Um, yep. So one of them was yep. our own asset, but there was one freestanding asset that we bought. So for two years, we basically didn't buy anything. And I, in hindsight, am extraordinarily grateful that we didn't buy anything during that time frame, um, because those assets would be causing nightmares for us right now. Um, so we started to buy again in 2023 when you know rates had already increased, cap rates had already dropped. We started to get discounts. So I think mid 2023 we bought an asset which is probably a 15% uh, discount from peak. And then uh, uh, beginning of 2024 we bought an asset which is probably 20 to 25% discount from peak. And now we're out and about looking for more assets because we think it's an incredible time to buy right now. Um, we can't seem to convince investors of that. I think that they they are having the same sort of phobia that they had in 2008, and I I can't blame that. I mean, investors are not investors. The vast majority of our investors are speculators right. who like to believe that they're investors. So what we've done is we hold a lot of programs showing people the data on why this is a much better time to buy than 24 months ago when everyone and their mother was investing. And we managed to convince maybe 25% of our investors of that. And those 25% are helping us buy properties. The remaining 75% will regret that they didn't lis listen to us three years from now. Yeah, no, it's, it's a sentiment I, I hear a lot of. Let's talk about asset classes. I mean, the focus on multifamily, you've done single family. Have you guys branched out into any other different types oh, yeah. of asset classes over the, over this time? And, and we, why, we have why? a ridiculously high number of asset classes. So here mm -hmm. are the the different asset classes that we worked on. So there's multifamily, there's multifamily new construction. So we do both value add and new construction. We have 600 units delivering um, in just the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. um, we do um, built to rent, which is basically not apartments, it's uh, townhomes, so large townhome communities. Um, and we built many built to rent communities and we're building many more uh, communities. Uh, we've done self storage, we've done office and flex together um, and with industrial. Um, and then we've done student housing. So these are all the different asset classes that we've sort of had our hands in over the next, over the last, uh, you know, six or seven years. We've also done stuff outside of real estate. So we've had investments in oil and gas. We've had investments in um, companies like uh, Delos, which is a technology company. So we've done a few of those sorts of things. They're not core to our mission, but we've done them. Our core mission is to build 10,000 rental townhomes, and we spun that off as a separate company. So my company, Grow Capitus, spun off a, a company called Mission 10K that only builds townhomes for rent. Is that uh, multiple markets? Mission 10K currently is building in five markets around right. the U.S. So Mission 10K it, it builds in what are known as high NOI markets. This is a term that I coined over the last four years. Due to massive increases in prices of properties and insurance, many of the best markets in the United States that used to be best before, for example, all of Texas, uh, most of Florida, have become low NOI markets. What has happened is their expense ratios have spiked so much that these markets are you know, low NOI compared to other markets. So Mission 10K focuses on markets where the following things are cheap. Cheap land, cheap construction cost, low insurance, low property tax, which means that we have to go away from some of the highest growth markets in the U.S. Sure, sure. Yeah, some of the tax stuff, you take Houston, I mean, uh, or, or insurance rather, some of the, I mean, I hear there's assets in Houston that uh, like are uninsurable. <laughs> Or we'll see you stuff. can't even insure them. Yeah. So I think that what, what you have to understand is that these markets are extraordinary, but a solution has to be found to the double whammy of insurance and property taxes in markets like Texas. So, you know, we yeah. love Texas. We think it's an absolutely amazing market over the next 20 years. It might even be the best market in the U.S., all things considered. But if I can't give my investors any cash flow for five full years, then is that the definition of best? Yeah, it's a tough sell, a tough sell, especially with LP capital. What's the team look like? You're doing a lot of deals, a lot of asset classes, a lot of markets. Um, what's your team look like today? We're very lean. We use an incredible amount of software and an incredible number of people in the Philippines. So we have a mm -hmm. um, company that I own in the Philippines that has 21 employees. They're all full time. They all work Pacific Standard Time. Uh, they have their own uh, managers, directors, supervisors in the Philippines. They do their own training and recruiting, hiring, firing. We simply receive services from them mm -hmm. um, 
and so 21 of them, including their director. Um, and so that three team supplements everything. The US staff is pretty lean. There are two full-time people in the, in the acquisition side. There are four full-time people, five full-time people in the development side. Um, and then the operations team is, you know, an ops director, uh, two ops directors, and then everyone else is in the Philippines. So altogether we've got, uh, and then we've got a pretty large marketing team. So that altogether there's uh, more than a dozen employees in, in sort of investor marketing, but only um, the, the, the director, um, the deck creator and the uh, copywriter are in the US. And then there's about, you know, nine employees in the Philippines. So altogether 34 employees, uh, 36 employees uh, full-time and then dozens of contractors and then of course we have hundreds of people that work for us on at the at the at the locations at the property locations of course yeah on site what kind of with that kind of a team and that that's tremendous um and i love that the technology leverage there and the, the overseas leverage what uh, what kind of deal flow are you guys looking at across all the asset class and he said multifamily you know has been a little slower the last year but um mm -hmm. is there do you have targets there or are you just saying hey We've got a buy box for these asset classes. When when one lands in there, we're gonna we're gonna jump on it. How do you approach the the deal? We have flow no targets, just it, buy boxes. If the like? buy box is empty, then we buy nothing. Remember, for two years we bought two assets or one and a half because the buy box was empty. The buy yeah. box is more yeah. filled up now than it was before. So th there's no point in having you know these these targets because it sort of leads you in the wrong direction. You end up buying assets that yeah. you shouldn't be buying. Uh, so we don't set targets like that. Um, we, uh, so on the acquisition side, which is primarily multifamily, though we look at other assets like self-storage and industrial as well, um, our, our goal is that to have 100 uh, new properties in our funnel every week, so 5,000 a year. Uh, and then on the land side for the development group, um, we are, it's the same goal, it's 100. Um, on the, and right now we're hitting about 75% of the goal for both. So we're underwriting or, or looking at about 3,500 properties a year on the acquisition side, and a little more than that, maybe 4,000 pieces of land, because um, these are two discrete teams, they don't overlap. Um, mm -hmm. So that, you know, basically if we can get to three projects on each side out of those, you know, 6,000, uh, you know, prospects, then we're pretty happy. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Uh, big team, distributed, different asset classes. What, is, what does your week look like? What, where does your time best spent? And what do you enjoy doing the most? Uh, what I enjoyed in the most is podcasts and I do two podcasts a week. Um, so, you know, two hours, I, I don't have a podcast of my own. I'm, I'm, I've never really thought about launching one, but I've appeared on about three or 400 of them. This is my favorite time of the week because I also create content. So a lot of people say content is king. Well, when I'm here with you for an hour every week, I'm talking about different things. My team takes that content and puts it up both long form and short form on YouTube and sends it out to our, our, um, you know, our, 76,000 accredited investors. Um, and so that allows me to create content without uh, writing things, which I hate sure. doing. I, I get writer's block. This is much easier because you're asking a question and I'm, all I'm doing is simply responding and sure. reacting. And so uh, that's the most fun part of my job. The second most fun part would be Groundbreaker Summit. Groundbreaker Summit is a 75 minute event that I do every Wednesday. Um, my team pitches five, uh, four to five pieces of land, and we go through those pieces of land. We learn about new markets, um, and then the acquisition summit is the following day. It's 60 minutes, and usually we go through four properties that my ac acquisitions team has underwritten. Those are the, really the most fun part of the job because you learn about new properties, new markets. You know, you get to be the shark in Shark Tank and say yes or thumbs down or you know things sure. like that. So it's very fun. Um, the rest of the the, the time I spend a lot of my time with technology and optimization, asking questions of my, my, my staff. I have a uh, chief operations officer. She really runs the company. Her name's Anna. I mean, it's her job to run the company. Everyone in the company, except for my executive assistants report to her. Mm -hmm. um, so she runs it. You know, my VP of marketing obviously is off doing their own thing. Same VP of marketing I've had for eight or nine years. So they know their job. Right. Um, and then a director of operations that is responsible for all the PPMs and the K1s and, you know, all of these other, you know, things that you, you need to keep the company going. We don't have any on-site legal staff, but we're, we've been working with the same lawyers for five years. And so they know us, we know them. Uh, the structure works fairly well. I spend about five to six hours a week talking with investors. Uh, most of my investor communication is through webinars and podcasts, but one-on-one -on -one, 
we have 1,016 investors as of yesterday, and I, all of them have access to me directly. Sure. So they, they, you know, they talk with my investor relations director a lot, but sometimes they just it, like to talk with me. So I haven't reached the point in my life where I say, you know, sorry that you can't, I can't do that. So maybe five, six, half-hour conversations with investors. Yeah, yeah, that's a perfect setup. Um, mid twenty twenty four. You know, we're, we've kind of seen what's happened so far this year. We got an election year, but he's watching the Fed. How are you guys looking at the back half of 2024? We believe that the economy will weaken. Um, there's a lot of disbelief in that because people have been saying that for a while and it hasn't happened. And I understand that, that there's disbelief. But please understand that the way that the Federal Reserve works is additive, meaning the when when they have these extraordinary high rates, and by the way, we currently inflation is running at three and a half percent in May 2024. We do not need rates this high for inflation at three and a half. We needed rates this high for inflation at six or seven or eight or nine. So there is absolutely no doubt in my mind, and I, I'm a numbers guy. I look at math and I say there is no way we need rates to be this high for three and a half percent. What that means is that three and a half percent inflation will decline. Now. I don't un know the speed at which it declines. I don't, mm -hmm. and I also know based on the Fed raising rates 14 times since World War II, that the downward slope of inflation, and they've succeeded 100% of the time, by the way, the Fed has killed inflation 14 times since World War II and has never failed. Once they had a partial failure when they bought rates down, but they cut them too soon, rates went back up, and then they had to cut them again. So they had one of these instances, and that was in the mid-80s. But otherwise, they've always been successful 100% of the time. Right. And that's because they can just keep raising rates until they basically destroy enough demand to bring inflation down below zero. So, And they're not even trying that. But what eventually ends up happening, right? In Out of those 14 times, some were very minor. So I'll, I'll just take the 10 that were major. Nine times out of those 10, they put the economy in recession. So the Fed always wins, but almost inevitably it wins by causing a recession because they don't have tools fine-tuned enough to be able to say, I want to bring demand down to almost 0%, but I don't want the economy to go into recession. They don't have any such tools because every move that the Fed makes, it impacts the economy six to nine months after they make that move. When the Fed cuts rate in July last year, the impact happens in March this year. Mm -hmm. And they can't for foresee that impact or know how much of an impact there is. So they're guessing. They know that everything will happen nine months in the future. What I'm seeing very clearly is that the U.S. economy is weakening. Payrolls last year, last month were at 175,000. Inflation readings came in muted, um, the, the latest ones in May this year. Um, and then I'm also looking at uh, jobless claims. They're rising. The, what the Fed said would happen is happening. What hasn't happened is the schedule. The Fed felt we may be able to start raise, uh, dropping rates by December last year, maybe February this year. Well, obviously, none of those things have happened. Sure. In May, they're not dropping rates. We think that they might drop rates in September. We think they might drop in December. What we have clearly seen, though, is it's bringing inflation down. It's just not in a straight line. The last 14 times that they succeeded, it wasn't straight either. It was generally a downward direction, but they were times when inflation went right back up. So they waited a few more months and it went back down. Imagine these, the current interest rates are so high that what the Fed has done is placed a thousand pound weight on the chest of the economy. So the Fed does nothing, doesn't raise rates. It's still a thousand pounds. It's still pushing the economy down every day. This is why I, I laugh at people who think that the Fed needs to, needs to raise rates again. They've already got a thousand pound weight on the chest of the economy. There is no documented evidence that any economy in history has ever tolerated these rates forever. Right. You can tolerate for a year. You can tolerate for months. You cannot tolerate it forever. These rates are absurdly high. So they, this is why the Fed has made very clear statements that we don't consider, despite the, the, the spike in inflation in the last six months, we don't consider that we will need to raise rates further. What, we'll, what we are saying is we might need to hold them where they are for longer than we forecast eventually. And because we're data-driven, we, we're simply going to say we're data-driven. Longer? Who knows? So That's to, great to us, you know, yep. one rate hike is almost a certainty to this year. But when in the year it happens, I don't know. Could two happen? Sure. I'm data-driven too. We'll see what payrolls look like next month and the month after. But for the moment, it could be one rate hike this year, two rate hikes this year. 
but there's zero percent chance the Fed will hike rates. Sorry, uh, one rate drop this year, two rate sure. drops this year, but no no rate hikes. So to us, this there's a normalizing of the real estate market that is happening already and will continue to happen. We expect that the lowest prices that you'll get for multifamily on a cap rate basis will come in Q3 or Q4 of this year, but we fully expect that prices in 2025 will be higher because what we've seen before is that the multifamily market is predictive in nature. You know, you do not actually need interest rates to go down for prices to go up, right? So every single quarter from the second quarter of 2022, cap rates were increasing, right? Which means prices were falling. So second quarter of 2022, third quarter, they fell. That the, sorry, they increased, the cap rates increased. Third quarter, fourth quarter, first quarter of this year, second quarter of this year. But second quarter of this year, is where cap rates didn't decompress. They, they stayed where they are. So the market has come to the conclusion, okay, we're either at bottom or close enough to bottom, we'll start making investments. So there's a lot of money that has been sitting on the sidelines for the last year and a half that is now beginning to come into the marketplace. It's cautious money, but it's coming in. And so it's putting a, a basically, it's putting a ceiling under cap rates so they can't go any higher. So I expect that we might see some increase in cap rates in Q3 or Q4 of this year, but they're going to be small increases. And I expect in 2025, I expect that cap rates will start to go down again and prices will start to rise again because all of these things are predictive. And I wanna give you one example so people really understand how predictive markets are. When I ask people this question, in the 2008 to 2012 debacle, when do you think the stock market bottomed? Usually people tell me, oh, probably 2010, probably 2011. No. The stock market bottomed only five months from the time that Lehman Brothers went out of business. Lehman went out of business yeah. in September, October of 2008. The stock market bottomed on March 12th, 2009. That's how predictive the market is. It took years for real estate to bounce back. It took years for businesses to bounce back, but the market bottoms quicker. Right, right. Um, are you guys seeing a lot of distress out there in multifamily? You know, when we're looking at deals, we're, we're only looking really in our market, but we're seeing basis on stuff that, you know, you would kill for a couple of years ago. The, obviously, you're trying to make it pencil with, with the debt, but the basis is incredible. What are you guys seeing out there nationally? Um, the same thing that you're seeing there, we just look at it dif differently. Um, so let me define distress. I think one of the problems is, the word distress is means different things to different people. So I, I sure. want to define it specifically. Perfect. Distress to me in real estate is when an asset is being sold at well below its value. This obviously happened in 2008. We are seeing absolutely zero distress in occupied 90% plus occupied multifamily in the United States. In any market in the United States, none of them qualify as distress prices. Prices have come down in certain places by 15%, others 20%, some places 25%. But these prices are down simply because of the fact that interest rates are higher. And on a debt coverage ratio, these are the right prices. Mm -hmm. We are not seeing any market in the US where somebody puts a property out and one offer comes in. Right now, we're still seeing 10 offers, 15 offers, 20 offers. These offers may be 25% lower than they were in sure. 2022. But the definition of distress is that the price is being driven down by a lack of demand, which is what we saw in 2008, 9, and 10, where I was the only bidder on properties that cost $250,000 to build that I was buying for $90,000, right. right? Nobody else was interested. Right. That level of distress does not exist in any multifamily market in the United States, has not existed for any asset that is occupied. Therefore, there is no distress in the multifamily market. What is there? is distress for investors. There are 20 million apartment units in the United States. Let's assume all of these properties are 200 units. They're not, but let's assume that. Well, sure. that's 100,000 properties. The number of properties that are debt distressed, because all the distress is related to debt, the right? To, yep. to, right? Is roughly 2,500 to 3,000 in the next 12 months. And then there'll be more after that, but let's just talk about the next 12 months. 2,500 to 3,000 properties are in distress. Let's assume each property had $8 million in investor equity, right? So now you're basically looking at, you know, whatever that number comes out to $20 billion in investor money that is in distress. Investor money is in distress, right? 
So if you have 2,500 properties and 50 investors in each, those 75,000 investors, their money is in distress because right. the value of their properties have dropped so much that if they're sold today, they can be sold like this. Like in five seconds, you can sell your property, but the price it sells at will wipe out 100% of their equity. Sure. So the word distress is being used incorrectly, Devin. There is only distress for 75,000 investors. There is no distress in the multifamily space because everything is liquid and everything sells. That's a great, great uh, point. I appreciate that. Um, your feedback for two groups of people. One is somebody, and I'm, you talk to these people all the time, they're, they're an aspiring or prospective investor, high income earner, whatever, just dipping their toe in. What do you tell that person that's just starting to look at this, uh, this real estate game, you know, alternative investing, maybe becoming an LP investor? What do you tell that person? You lucky bastard. You're, you're starting at the bottom of the cycle, right? And I don't really know if this is the bottom, Devin, but I listened to Warren Buffett and Warren Buffett says, in my long career, I have never managed to once call a bottom correctly, Right. but I've made hundreds of billions of dollars, right? So what I know is that we are approaching the bottom and for any prospective investor to start when a market that is one of the most powerful and most reliable markets in the world is close to a bottom, you lucky bastard. I love it. How about for the aspiring operator, maybe somebody that's a little further along, but they want to go out and be the Neil Bawa. They want to be the GP. They want to do the depreciation. They want to make this full time and they're starting to explore that. What do you tell that person? Best time to start, but I don't resent you because you're going to find it hard to raise equity. So right. ironically, the deals are there. The stuff that you're buying today will be worth more. Right there, the industry right now is bearish. So the way we look at cap rates, rent increases, we're bearish, right? right? And so everyone's very conservative. I think that in two or three years, you'll see that the properties you bought now are doing actually a lot better than the ones you bought in 2021 or 2022. So I, wonderful time for you to buy properties. The assets are priced, you know, really well. I don't, you know, I don't envy the job that you have of, you know, convincing investors. And that's really the key part of your job. Sure. Sure. Makes sense. Well, Neil, you've been a wealth of knowledge uh, and I really appreciate your time uh, and, and I love following you. If somebody listening wants to connect, you've got resources that you can share with them, et cetera. Where do we send them? So roughly 25,000 people come to multifamilyu.com to get access to knowledge around all forms of real estate, but also other things that we're interested in climate change, artificial intelligence, and anything else that catches our fancy, by the way, um, a, a lot of economics, a lot of macroeconomics. Multifamily U is a completely free portal. Not only are there no subscriptions, no upsell and no paid education packages, there's a guarantee that there never will be. I right. It. So we, yeah. we it's basically meant to be a Wikipedia of real estate analytics um, and a bunch of other things uh, like we have a course there that's extremely popular. Ironically, it's the most popular uh, program there, course there. They're all free. Um, it's called 10x your business by using virtual assistants. I use 30 different demos to tell people exactly how I use my virtual assistants from in the Philippines um, and a bunch of other things are in there. So that's probably the best place to start because many of you are not even sure if you want to invest in multifamily. So sure. Join a community that's there for education, that's there for, you know, discussions and then go from there. Um, you know, four times a year, if you're in that community, you'll probably get invitations to our um you know, to our properties. You can just ignore them if you don't want to invest, but you'll learn a lot. Fantastic. Well, we'll link to that in the show notes. If you're listening, you can scroll down and connect with Neil and team through the, uh, through the link we'll have there. Neil, really appreciate it. It was great to see you. Great to connect and um, looking forward to the next couple of years here and continuing to follow you guys. So thank you. Sounds good. Thanks for having me on. All right. See you. Thank you for listening to the DJE podcast. For more information, please go to djetexas.com.